Hello again, it's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And today without my glasses, because I forgot them at home. If you're currently looking at getting new speakers, you're probably wondering what size you should get, in particular, in relation to your room. Maybe you are looking at a 5-inch woofer, or maybe a 6-inch or an 8-inch maybe even a three-way system, and then they have like the horizontal ones and the vertical ones. Which one's the right one for your room? You probably also heard somewhere that you should match the speaker size to your room, because otherwise you might end up overpowering it and causing all sorts of trouble. So today I wanna have a look at the science behind matching the speaker size to your room with you, see what's actually going on, and give you a better strategy to actually figure out what size speaker is right for you. So let me start off right away by saying that you can't actually overpower your room. There's no scientific link between speaker power and room size. Because basically speaker power just translates to volume, right? So more power just means higher volume from your speakers. But a higher speaker volume, higher SPL from your speakers, doesn't cause new issues in your room. In fact, I made a whole video about that, which I'm linking in the card right now. But even if a higher volumes caused issues, you could always just turn the volume down. It's pretty simple, right? So there's no real problem here. A higher, higher potential speaker power or a higher available power from your speaker doesn't mean that it causes issues in your room. In fact, having higher power available from our speakers means we have more headroom, or in other words, less distortion for the same volume. And this is definitely an advantage for us mixers or recording engineers if we're working with uncompressed material. So this here is a, a graph made by Bogic Petrovic from My Room Acoustics. Um, just a quick side note, by the way, unfortunately, Bogic passed away last year, and this really is quite sad. He was a very giving person who, who added a lot to the community, uh, and it's, it's a, a real loss. Um, we'll, we'll definitely miss him. But looking at this graph, I don't really want to go into too much detail, but what it shows us is that for a certain driver size, for a certain amount of power available, there's only so much headroom that the speaker can give beyond the average listening level that you're working at. But with uncompressed audio, with waveforms with ha which have really high peaks, you need a lot of headroom for the speaker to be able to play those high peaks without going into distortion. So purely from a power perspective, in a studio, you really want a speaker with the highest power that you can possibly get which basically equates to getting the biggest speaker you can possibly get. And it doesn't matter what size your room is. This has nothing to do with the size of your room. This is purely about speaker power and available headroom in order to represent the, the waveform, the energy in the waveforms properly without distorting. Another reason that often gets mentioned for limiting speaker size in a small room is to limit low-end extension, uh, which also often comes along with limiting the driver size. So basically, it's all about how low down in frequency um, a speaker can play. But I personally think this is actually a bad idea unless you're just starting out. Let me explain why. The idea here is to put less low frequency energy into the room in order not to cause standing waves, right? So standing waves are the main cause for the big peaks and dips that you'll experience across your room and at your listening position, which makes it so hard, for example, to balance the kick and the bass in the mix, right? They also ring out in time, which causes a lot of that mush that you might experience in the low end in an un untreated room. So technically this is true. You could limit the low frequency extension of your speaker in order never to create these standing waves which will in turn never cause those issues. But of course that also means that you can't actually work with those frequencies in your mix. You, you'll never hear them. It's completely out of your control. I kind of like to think of it like trying to race a car. So you're entering this, this car race, but you're limiting the top speed of your car to like 60 miles per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, right? At that point, you can't ever win the race. 
you're just never going to be able to go fast enough. Of course, this can be beneficial if you're just starting out, right? If you're just getting your feet wet, if you want to just learn to drive or learn to mix in this analogy, right? So in that case, it might make sense. But if you want to take this seriously, if you want to take mixing and recording and working with music seriously, you have to deal with these problems. You have to learn how to deal with these low frequencies, both in terms of how they interact with the room and what that means for you while you're actually mixing. And by the way, just to be clear, when we're talking about limiting the low frequency extension of the speaker by choosing a smaller driver, we're talking about five inches, a five inch woofer or less, because modern five inch, inch woofers easily go down to about 50 hertz, which is smack bang in standing wave territory in just about any room, right? So if you want to make this work by picking a smaller speaker, we're talking about a very, very small speaker. And as we just saw, that usually means very little power, which means very little headroom, which means more distortion. It's basically a bad idea. All that said, there is one practical reason why you would want to limit the speaker size when you're working in a small room. And that reason is that you absolutely need to be able to place your speakers correctly in relationship to your listening position. So I'm talking how far apart your speakers are and how far away they are from your listening position. Because depending on where your listening position is placed to get a balanced low end, you'll have a very limited amount of space available to place your speakers to get that proper detailed balanced stereo image. Because remember, you don't get to pick your listening position yourself, right? Your listening position needs to be placed at your room's low end sweet spot and your room's low end sweet spot depends entirely on your room's shape and dimensions, right? So your, your room determines where your listening position is. It's your job to just find it and make sure you get to sit there when, once everything is set up, right? So depending on where that is, you'll have limited space to the front wall. And if that's only maybe three, four feet, you can't put in a midfield speaker, a huge midfield speaker that's meant to be placed at, let's say, six feet away, right? It's never going to work. Instead, what you need is a probably smaller near field monitor that's made to work at those distances. So you need a speaker that is small enough so you can experiment with the exact positioning so you can really nail down that stereo image. And it's absolutely crucial to get this right. This isn't something you can compromise on just because you want a bigger speaker. You always, always, always have to prioritize positioning over speaker type shape or size. That's why I'm not a huge fan of these horizontally laid out three-way or 2.5-way systems, for example, if you want to use them in small rooms. They're usually just too bulky to experiment with the positioning properly and really get that stereo image that you need to work properly. They're great for larger rooms if you have the luxury of space between your listening position and the front wall, but in small rooms they're usually just more trouble than they're worth. So in summary, if you're trying to find the right speaker size for your room, first of all, remember that you can't somehow overpower your room. And it's complete nonsense. In fact, in terms of power, you'd actually want to get the speaker with the highest power, the largest speaker possible in order to have that headroom available while you're working. You also shouldn't get a smaller speaker in order to limit low end extension, in my opinion, unless you're just starting out you really should just learn to deal with it instead. You're gonna have to sooner or later anyway. So what you actually wanna do to figure out the right size speaker is to figure out how much space you have available between your listening position and the front wall, and then get the biggest speaker you can, but without compromising placement, right? That's the crucial part. Go as big as you can, as long as you are, you still have the flexibility to play with the placement, to experiment with the placement and really nail down that stereo image. Now, of course, that means you really need to know where your listening position is first. That's the first step to figuring out how big your speaker can be. And as I mentioned, you can't just pick your listening position yourself. 
if you want to have any chance at all at a balanced low end. The room determines where the low end sweet spot is and it's your job to find it and that's where you'll place your listing position and that's what will determine how much space you have available. Now you could do all this with complicated and time consuming measurements, but a much quicker and simpler way is to use a systematic structured listening test. I call this the base hunter technique and I developed it specifically for this purpose. So if you're currently finding a really bad low end balance, or you're setting up a new room and you're trying to figure out which direction to face, or you want to figure out how big your speaker can be and you need to figure out where your listening position is first, I want you to download my free guide to the Base Hunter technique, which I've linked in the description. It's a complete no-brainer in comparison to taking measurements and you should be able to go through it in about an hour or so. So again, just click on the link in the description to get my free guide to the Base Hunter technique. But that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you soon.